everybody, Matt Yoakum back here again today with Pro Sound Effects. Today's tutorial is going to be about editing in sync. Editing in sync is important whether you are doing dialogue editing, sound effects editing, Foley music, um, because one of our primary jobs as sound artists in general is to make sure that the content that we're cutting is in sync with the image that's being delivered to the audience, right? Like, obviously, the whole suspension of disbelief would go away if, you know, everything was two or three or four frames out. It's super distracting. It's eye-catching. And your brain is basically programmed to understand that everything around it is in sync because that's how we see and hear the world. Like, our eyes and our ears have adjusted uh, to be able to understand the relationship between what we're seeing and what we're hearing. So anytime that we're not careful about sync in post, it usually stands out uh, like a thor sore thumb. Now, the thing about sync is that, you know, most... I I'm going to be talking about this in the context of film. Obviously, so, like, one of the reasons I bring that up is because uh, one of the topics we're going to be discussing is, um, you know, just a, a brief section on sort of frame rate and how that relates to timing of things. And in the film world, almost all the films that we see, in fact, all of the films that we see... Uh, are at 24 frames per second. Obviously, if you're in the TV world, uh, that is going to change based on region. So, you know, in, in the United States, uh, we work on NTSC, which is 2398. Uh, when I say the United States, it's really um, uh, the Americas. And then in Europe and Asia, uh, they work on the PAL system, which is 25 frames per second. And we're not really going to get into discussing the differences between these frame rates because honestly, it's 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 not like a huge big deal. It's not super relevant to what we're talking about. Um, but I'm just mentioning that because film is always at 24 frames per second. And um, the thing about that is like, you know, if you think about shooting a film at 24 frames in one second. The thing about sound is that there is no frame rate in audio. We have a sample rate. And so where there's 24 frames, or you can think of it as like 24 individual images uh, for a film, in the audio world, we've got 44 or 48,000 uh, little samples of sound in that same second. So there's a lot more wiggle room uh, in the audio realm than there is in the in the visual one. Uh, and that is going to matter for determining sync on some stuff. Uh, so that's why I mentioned that. Um, now, every session that I've ever worked in for film has always been 48K, 24-bit. Uh, Sometimes we'll do 32-bit float for the processing, but the final output, uh, output excuse me, is always 24. Uh, the bit depth doesn't have as much to do about timing. Uh, that's more of a dynamics thing. But 48K is the sample rate that we're going to assume everybody's working at. And we're just, for the sake of this video, going to assume that we're either working at 23.98 or uh, 24 frames per second. Um, so just really quickly, a couple of the topics that we're going to discuss is, uh, you know, the way I'm phrasing it is basically frame by frame editing. Uh, and we'll dive into a Pro Tool session and take a look at what that means. Um, and then we're going to be making sure that we are looking at guide tracks and why that's important uh, to basically have the production audio as a point of reference for sync. Um, and then we're going to talk just super briefly at the very end about sync compensation because I know in the past I've been asked a couple questions before about how we, um, you know, how we adjust for distance between you and the speakers and the display and that sort of thing. Um, so we're not going to go super in depth into that, but I'll just touch on it briefly. So for the first topic that we're going to discuss, we're going to talk about going frame by frame through the video file and why that's important. So we're actually just going to go ahead and dive right into Pro Tools over here. And, um, and if you'll excuse me, I'm probably going to be looking up every once in a while to check on my notes. But uh, so this is a short film. This was done by a super talented director named Linda Reese. Uh, this is a film called Lancaster Park. Um, the video file here is ungraded. It's raw, uh, raw footage, so it's uh, a little gray. But anyhow, um, any any time we are doing film sound, like I said before, we always want to make sure that we're being as accurate as possible. And one of the ways that we achieve that is by simply going frame by frame through the film, um, especially for for catching things in sync. So the first example we're going to look at is actually really simple. It's just 
our main character here, our, uh, this mom, she's going to be opening this fridge. And if we go frame by frame, uh, you can actually see here if I zoom in, it looks like the frame, uh, the fridge first begins to pop open from closed to open right here between these two frames. Uh, just a shortcut tip, by the way, the way that I'm, uh, without having my hand on the mouse, the way I'm going frame by frame through these is um, on your keyboard, you've got down here in this little section, you've got M and then the greater than and less than symbol and then the question mark key. These are our nudge keys. Um, the the greater than and left less than symbols so i'm just going to call them like left and right arrows for the sake of this um the right arrow is obviously moving right the left arrow or less than symbol is moving to the left and then on either side of that you have bigger steps or jumps which actually move if you have it set to one frame um in your nudge so actually right up here if you look at the top of this pro tool screen uh, we have grid and nudge. Down here on nudge, I always leave mine set to one frame. Um, so if you have it set to one frame, uh, and if you're in time code, uh, then if you hit M, it's going to move back by six frames, and the question mark is going to move forward by six frames. So it's kind of like a nice uh, way to jump in between larger distances. Um, and then there's the one step values beneath that. So. Uh, it looks like the fridge is starting to pop open here, but if we go up to our production audio, the, the real transient for it starting to open is actually about right here and somewhere in the middle of this frame, uh, just a little before the halfway point. Now, what I talked about earlier with there being, you know, no frame rate in audio is that the camera is only capturing, in this case, it's actually a 2398 video that I'm working with here, but the audio is being sampled 48,000 times a second. So there's tons and tons of opportunity for things to be in between frames and audio. Now, you might think, why does that matter? Because if, you know, as long as I put things on the frame line, it's always going to look in sync and that's fine. But in most productions, especially in the film world, our goal is often to retain as much of the production audio as possible. And the thing is that between the whole length of a frame, if you uh, have things that are on either side of that frame edge and then things in between, you will hear a double hit or what you know I would call like a flam. And we want to avoid flaming um, by using this dialogue guide here because you want things to sound cohesive, especially when they're short transient uh, events such as like a door opening or closing gunshots, footsteps, all these things that have sort of sharp little transient peaks, you don't want to hear double hits of those things. So in a 24 frame session, one the length of one frame is about 42 milliseconds. That's almost exactly a frame length. It's about 42 milliseconds in tw when we're at 24 FPS. And so, you know, half a frame is 24 milliseconds off. And if you have something that's starting right on the frame edge and then something 24 milliseconds later, it's a very short amount of time, but especially if it has a short, uh, sharp transient, you will definitely hear that twice. That's enough time for your brain to hear the difference between those two signals and to realize that there's something slightly off. Um, we have to have our transients very close together before our brain basically melds them into one event. And 24 milliseconds actually, even though it seems like a very short amount of time within one frame, it sounds off. So um, just keep that in mind when you're editing. Uh, the thing about going this way where we're going frame by frame through the actual picture is that I can always trust the image that I'm seeing uh, as being accurate, like if I stop here and my time codes line up, right? So for this example, we're at 102.22.08. I know for a fact that this frame, whatever's happening in this frame is in sync. Like that is the footage. So this frame edge right here that I'm on, because I'm in grid mode, it's going to snap. This frame edge is exactly what's happening right here in this frame. So everything else in between an audio land is, you know, sort of an unknown and we need to go look for it in the guide track, but, but we can be certain that this is what's happening. Now, the reason I mention that is because when, as soon as I hit play on something, we're not necessarily going to be looking at the exact sync. 
Now that may sound concerning, but it's, it's actually not that big of a deal. And the reason I say that is there's basically a couple of sanctioned, what I'll call sanctioned codecs uh, for Pro Tools. And what that means is um, uh, Avid's DNxHD format and Apple's ProRes are two examples of sort of sanctioned, um, you know, pro level video codecs that are shown empirically to always stay perfectly in sync. There's going to be very little um, drift backwards and forwards. Now, you know, getting in, there's, you know, I'm sure there may be some higher level people watching this that are going to, you know, want to talk about like clocking speeds and, and you know, um, uh, uh, black burst and that sort of stuff in terms of like maintaining perfect, you know, frame edge sync. But for the purposes of this video, you know, most people aren't dealing with that sort of level stuff. And, and even me, I have a very limited knowledge when it comes to that stuff. That's really like engineer's land. But, but the point is that no matter what codec you're using, um, you can always trust that this frame, when I'm going frame by frame, is accurate. So it doesn't matter how loose or tight your sync is on playback. Obviously, the goal is to have playback be as tight as possible. But in an H.264 codec, for example, which is super common because it's a small file size and you can maintain relatively high resolution, it's been empirically shown that when you hit play, uh, it, it could vary as much as one or two frames. Um, and that's actually enough to throw off sync visually sometimes. Now, that's not always the case. It's just been proven to happen under certain conditions. But my point is that we should trust the frame edge that we're seeing with our video here on the timeline. And that's why it's important to go frame by frame. Because things can look and feel slightly different when we're watching them play back. But if, you know, you go, ah, oh, was that out of sync? Yes or no? I can zoom real close in here on my timeline and verify that something's on the frame edge and that we're good to go. Um, sorry if that was a little redundant or repetitive, but I'm just trying to nail nail the point home that uh, we can trust our video as long as our time codes are matching and we're in sync in the actual session, whether or not we're hitting play. You know, I, I mentioned previously um, about how this thing is like slightly out, but the guide is what we want to trust. The thing is that when you're cutting in sync, most people can easily identify when something is about three to five frames out. You know, I know a lot of times um, if, if you're just like sitting down watching TV or something, there may be some sort of like a broadcast delay and I'll be looking at it and go, you know, is that in sync? And it's usually um, it's usually like something where it's one or two or three frames. But the point is, like, if you if you're cutting a sound effect and it's two or three frames out, sorry, three to five, that's like super noticeable. Two frames, if you're paying attention, that can look out of sync and expert level, you know, people who do this every single day and have had a lot of times can see things within about a frame of sync. Two, two frames is usually the zone where it becomes obvious for somebody who's really paying attention and looking for it. Um, and anything below uh, one frame, like what we would call sub frame sync, is really, some people will claim that they, you know, they're sensitive to sync, you know, under a frame. Honestly, um, I don't, I don't necessarily buy that personally, just because like I said, you know, the, there's 24 still images in one second for a moving picture file and anything in between that is extremely hard to discern. But like I was saying previously, it is easy to discern auditorily whether something is within a half a frame. So not to confuse that, um, it's, it's hard to tell if something is out of sync more than a frame visually. But aud auditorily, if we have something that's about a half a frame out, you can hear that flam, like I mentioned earlier. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, and the last point I'll make before we make uh, before we go and look at some of these things is we don't always need transients for the audio files to line up exactly on the frame edge. Because uh, like I said, you know, we don't really see things in and out of sync with about a frame as long as you're matching the guide. Uh, if it's there to begin with, then you're usually fine as long as that transient is somewhere within, uh, you know, one frame of that of that frame edge. But I personally, I just tend to be a little OCD, so I do like to cut things as close to the frame edge as possible when I'm doing transients. And uh, we'll look at a couple examples here in this short film. So, I'm going to put my headphones on here so I can hear. So this fridge is just the first little example. I mean, these, some of these examples are going to be really short. Um, but this fridge is one. So if I 
just play the dialogue track here. This dialogue track has her opening the fridge married to it. We can see the event right here in the middle. Uh, it's this transient peak. I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger so it's obvious. Um, so this right here, this highlighted section, this is her opening the fridge. Now, like I said, it looks like the fridge starts to pop open. It's like sealed there, and then we can see the widening of the gap here. But you know, on the fridge, they've got kind of those like rubber seals to keep things airtight. Um, and so it may just not be, uh, you know, opening wide enough to break the seal yet there. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna solo this and play this. Okay, so we can obviously tell that that's in sync. That's the other thing is I usually trust that the picture editor knows what they're doing and that the, all the stuff from DIT and the assistant editor and everybody involved has done their work to make sure that the production audio is in sync. There are cases where production audio can slip. There's sometimes just random mistakes that happen and that sort of thing happens. Nine times out of 10, we can trust the production audio is in sync. So here it looks good. So. You know, what's been added here is this this production audio already has kind of a low end uh, thump to it. So my sound effects editors cut in this additional layer here. Kind of the thinner upper end of that of that sound. Uh, and it layers nicely. Now, but the point is that this transient, like I said, was about halfway between uh, from, from the production audio, I mean, the, the transient for the production audio was about halfway between these frame lines. Um, so what we did here is we took the transient from this, from the sound effect, and we moved it to match. And you can see I just threw a marker down. Now you're saying, you might be asking yourself, you know, I'm in grid mode, you know, so, so do I need to move back to slip every time? Now there's a secret shortcut here that I love working with, and this is why I stay in grid the entire time. And that is, if I click the audio file and I hold down command, even though I'm in grid mode, I can now slip things backwards or forwards as if I were in slip mode and it's moving on a sample level instead of a frame level. So if I let go of command, I'm now going to snap to the grid again. Uh, so that's a super helpful thing. I can also, if I'm making a selection, if I hold command, I can click anywhere in between and then if I hold, you know, let go of command, I, it's, it's going to snap to the, the grid line on either side. So that's super useful. You can move things around by holding command. Uh, I love working that way. It makes everything super simple. Uh, so next, we're going to jump down the timeline, and we are going to take a look at cutting some feet. And I'm going to show you my process for this real quick. So if I pop these open... Here's the production. We're just going to take a listen to, I'm just going to solo this. Okay, so for this first section when she's walking away here, you can hear the feet kind of disappear as she gets far away, but that's fine. So now you would have a Foley person walk this, and if you don't have the budget for a Foley person, you know, like, especially in some of these shorter films, we don't have the ability to hire somebody to walk all the feet for us, we're going to cut these into sync. Um, so what you would do, at least my process, what I prefer to do, is I will zoom in, and I will literally go footstep by footstep. Because we have the feet here in our production audio, it's actually a little bit easier than if I didn't. Uh, and that's because I would have to go frame by frame and watch for her movements as to whether or not, you know, you can kind of see in the shoulders when she's actually making touchdown. Um, but the but the production audio here is in sync. So uh, we can just go to each one of these transients. Remember, I'm holding uh, command to get in between, but some of these are on the frame line, so that's fine. And I'll probably listen to it again. So let's see. Okay, so like here's this last step right here before it disappears and then we could just use her for sync and we would try to match the rhythm as well so it looks like a foot down might be there and again I'm just nudging through the frames here dropping markers you can drop markers by the way by uh, hitting enter the um, this enter all the way at the end the numeric enter which is not the same as return uh, return is going to take you to the beginning of the session, so it's definitely not what we want to do. So if you hit the enter button, that's going to drop a marker. I'm just hitting it quickly twice because it pulls up in this dialog and I hit it one more time to confirm. Um, okay, so let's scroll down to the feet here. So I've already selected uh, some feet. I just chose these from the Odyssey uh, Pro Sound Effects library. 
Um, these are some really good bare feet. These are called giant footsteps. They've actually got a lot of bass in them. Uh, but they are not actually really nice uh, barefoot feet recording. So I'm just going to take the bass out here. I'll pull this down and roll off some of that low end. Um, and then let's just see what these sound like on their own. Okay, so they have that kind of nice patty uh, sort of barefoot sound. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut each of these individual footsteps. You could actually do this because this is a nicely edited uh, library. Uh, we can actually just pull open uh, Strip Silence. I pull that open by hitting Command U. And then I can go ahead and just strip uh, the silence in between these footsteps. I'm going to zoom back in here. It'll do a pretty good job. Again, I can hold Command to get real close. And then I'm just going to set each one of these on my marker. Somewhere like this. Within a quarter frame of sync is really good um, in terms of you know hearing that flam. We'll we'll test it to hear what, to see if we hear it, um, but that should be good enough. That should be close enough. Uh, we'll go in and sort of dial these in. Pull out these tails a little bit. I'm old school paranoid where I like to have uh, fades on everything, even though there's an auto fade in and fade out feature. Um, you never know if the person that you're sending to is going to have that feature enabled, so I always like to put fades on things. Um, makes me feel better. Okay, so let's just start by turning these way down. Let's just solo these. Okay. Maybe we should get one more at the end there for her last footstep, maybe about there. I'm just going to copy that guy over. I did that with control, option, click. Uh, the option part of that is the copy, because if you hold option and drag, that's a copy. And the control click is what snaps to your selection. So if you combine those two, control, option, click, uh, it'll copy. I'm just going to use one of these footsteps from back here, so that's fine. Um, okay. Let's take a listen. So the rhythm's a little funky, but that's the thing is like, you know, as long as it matches our production audio, let's, let's see how this sounds again. Uh, so our rhythm may be a little off there. You can tell by the rhythm, uh, but let's, let's find that. Okay, so what I'm going to do actually here is I'm going to solo just the guide and the feet. Uh, shift S to solo those. Okay, so it starts to get off somewhere in here. Um, and this is the part where, like, you know, because this disappeared, it could be a little challenging. Um, sometimes what I'll do is I'll pull this guy down temporarily just so we can see them side by side. And then you can actually see that these sharper transients, the, the bigger transients, which are the footfall, actually probably would sound better close to lining up with the transients of these feet here. So it's just an example of like what to look out for. You know, always feel free to go back and adjust if you feel you need to. There's no reason to, you know, be married to the first decision you make. I'm going to mute some of these later ones and see how they, how they play. So it looks like that one might be a little later based on the sound. Okay, I'd be convinced by that. That sounds like it's matching pretty well. And then I would just add some reverb onto this. As she walks away and bring the volume down on it over time. I'm just gonna pop this open and do it here. Okay, so we're definitely missing a footstep at the end there, but you guys get the idea, it's pretty close. Um, so I would, I would definitely turn that guy back on and massage that in. Um, but you get the idea. The idea is that we're trying to match this guide because once the dialogue editor has done their job, it's not like we're going to be replacing all of the production with sound effects. You know, the goal here is to have these things live symbiotically together and for one to enhance the other because, um, you know, it, there's obviously lots of moving parts here. Um, and the dialogue editor is going to leave that stuff in, assuming that that's good production, it's in sync. 
Uh, so we're going to do our best to match that. And the last example here is really simple. Again, it's just a car door shut. Right? If we go frame by frame, there's, it actually looks like it might be one frame off in the production. So this might be a thing where I nudge this production by one frame. Because I can see it's clearly shut there. We would check to make sure... Well, his dialogue is actually off screen. Stay safe, Rita. The guy who's shutting the door. So it's probably okay to nudge this one frame. And then I would go down here and I would just make sure that our car door... So this transient was actually about a half a frame early. So I'm going to just snap it more like to here and try this and see how it sounds together. All right. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. So just to address really quickly uh, the point that I mentioned earlier that I was just going to touch on in terms of uh, whether or not we are uh, adjusting for sync compensation. Um, we adjust for sync compensation inside of Pro Tools in terms of you can, what I mean by that is you can set a delay for the audio to play based on your, um, based on your screen's feedback. There's an app that I like to use called Catch and Sync. Um, and basically what Catch and Sync does is you'll take a really high frame rate video of your monitor and you'll do something like a two pop and it'll show you exactly how far that is off. And then you can set the adjustment in Pro Tools. Uh, it is here under Video Sync Offset. So like for my TV, I know my TV is 58 milliseconds off because of this app called Catch and Sync that I use. Um, we can put a, a link for that in the description. Um, I, you have to, it's a paid app. I don't remember how much it costs, but it's a super useful tool if you want to check this sort of thing out. Usually it's not an issue, especially in a tight, closed system like this home studio, or if you're working on like a laptop screen, those are usually uh, pretty tight. Um, but anyhow, uh, my point is somebody asked me once if uh, we adjust for like the, the distance between uh, the screen and a movie theater, which could be, you know, 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 feet away, you know, how do you compensate, you know, edit wise for the sync? And the answer is you don't. You cut, like I was saying before, you know, you trust the frame that we're on here in the timeline in Pro Tools and you don't make any other adjustments for sync beyond matching the guide track, which I just mentioned before. Um, that is going to be the engineer's job at the movie theater to set their delays correctly so that if you're sitting, you know, at the very back of the theater 40 feet away, that when by the time the audio hits your ears, it's as close to possible, uh, close to possible of being totally in sync. But that's not something we worry about. Trust the frame edge. Trust the the video that you have. If it's synced up correctly with time code, and you go from there. Um, that's all we'll say about that. Um, that's really you know, that sort of covers the essence of making sure that we're cutting in sync. Um, you know. The goal here, like I said, obviously, is that we want things to feel in sync because that's the way the natural world works. Our brain is pretty sensitive to it, and it's what makes for a cohesive track. There's nothing worse than getting back Foley that doesn't match the production at all, having things that are double hitting. It's frustrating because then you have to go through and do all that little nitpicky work, but if we just handle this stuff up front when we're editing in the first place, it just makes our lives so much easier that by the time we get to the mix, you know, and you have clients come in, once all these pieces are getting assembled together for the first time on a big screen, uh, you know, you don't have somebody sound like they've got three feet when they're walking. Um, and you don't want to have car doors, you know, shutting, you know, twice and flamming gunshots, all that kind of stuff. Um, the last piece that I'll just say creatively, though, is that, you know, right here we were talking about sync and we were focusing on things that really do have sort of like transient detail. And the thing about that is that obviously not everything that has sync has a transient. There's plenty of stuff like whooshes, car buys, uh, you know, basically anything else that's just a softer motion uh, that really requires more of like a feel. Um, on things like car buys, I'll typically wait till the thing comes right to the edge of frame if it's going by us or if it's going through the middle, you know. I'll just try to find sort of the peak of the slope of the waveform and then I'll match that up with the, um, 
with the car going by as in center to the screen as possible, depending on how fast it's moving, what the frame rate was. Uh, and then just sync those things up. Uh, and sometimes it takes some trial and error. Sometimes you can't even explain it. Some things feel better if they're slightly to one side or the other in terms of sync. It's just kind of a feel thing. Um, and there's other examples of like, you know, with creatures or uh, explosions or gunshots or things where, you know, maybe you, you want transients to be slightly off from one another in order to create a bigger sounding event where you have multiple occurrences of something uh, to lengthen something out over time. Um, so there are design implications where, you know, perfect sync isn't necessarily the goal where all your transients need to be stacked. Uh, but for the most part, and especially in terms of the more mundane editing for things like Foley and hard effects, uh, we want to make sure that we're using that production as a guide. That's sort of our, um, that is sort of our grid that we're following. Um, and then trusting in the frame line of your uh, film as you, as you nudge back and forth. Um, so keep those shortcuts in mind that I mentioned in terms of the nudging, uh, holding down command when you're in uh, grid mode, if you like to work that way. There's plenty of people who like to work in, in slip mode. And actually, in, if you do, if you are one of the people that likes to work in slip, if you hold command, it'll actually temporarily put you into grid mode. So you can snap things to the grid in slip mode as well. Um, so definitely t take that, use that to your advantage. Um, please shoot me an email or, uh, you know, hit me up on, on Instagram, wherever you can find me on YouTube, leave comments. I'll try to reply. Uh, be sure and like and comment on this. If you have anything, subscribe to Pro Sound Effects. It really helps them out. Check out their sound effects. They have incredible bundles and stay tuned for the next one.